Praise God. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So let's just agree together and pray and just thank God for this and welcome the Holy Spirit. Father, you meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And right now we ask for direction, wisdom, understanding. Help us as we go into the word of God. Holy Spirit, breathe upon the seed of God, Father God's word. May it find its mark in our heart and our lives will never be the same again to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Well, we're continuing on with part two of why we worship, why we worship. And I want to zone in on this thought process today, the weapon of worship. Worship can be weaponized. A little review of part one. We learned that there is worship, Jesus talks about. There's worship, but then there is, Jesus said this himself in John 4, true worship. Let's just take a look at that verse again, John 4, 23. But a time is coming and is already here. Remember, this is Jesus talking. But a time is coming and is already here. It's now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. Oh, my goodness. I think most people have experienced insincere praise, right? You know, Jim, you really look good today. And Jim's thinking, come on, be honest with me. It just It's almost offensive when people say things that, you know, they're trying to be kind, but it's really untrue and it's, un, it's insincere. Ladies, you wouldn't tolerate your husband, right, giving you insincere praise. Honey, that dress, that's you. You just look beautiful. I'm, I'm going back to the game here right now. Ladies, you're like, come on. Be honest. If you love me, be honest with me. Well, God, the Father, He's looking for true worshipers who will give Him true, authentic, sincere worship. God, the Father, is looking for true worshipers. And that's you. That's me. With Christ in us, we can give Father God holy and righteous worship with God's help. And we've begun to learn why true worship is a big deal to Father God. Because not only is it what God desires from us, but it can be weaponized for our benefit. That's right, you heard me correctly, weaponized. Worship can be weaponized to destroy the enemies of God. Remember in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 22, we read that in part one. And basically it came down to when Jehoshaphat was surrounded by enemies, didn't know what to do. God said, I'll fight your battles for you. But he said, here's what your part is. And 2 Chronicles 20, verse 22, it says, And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the men of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, those were the enemies who had come against Judah, those were God's people, and they, the enemies, were destroyed. You know what? Remember, in the Old Testament, there are types and pictures in the natural that give us eyes and insight into the supernatural because we walk by faith, not by sight, right? And then we're going to read later in Ephesians 6 how it says that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. This isn't about people, enemies of people, because Jesus even said in Luke 6, he said, I want you to pray for the, bless those who curse you. He said, I want you to love your enemies. So if we're talking about people, God has never called us to make enemies out of people or to be um, hateful toward people. But when it comes to spiritual enemies, when it comes to principalities and powers of wickedness and darkness in high spiritual places, God says that we can take them down with the word of truth. We're called to that. So this is a picture in 2 Chronicles of dealing with physical enemies, giving us a picture of how we as the body of Christ deal with spiritual enemies. You know, when Pam and I lived in Brentwood, Tennessee, just on the south side of Nashville, I remember in our, out of our great room, we had a beautiful picture of the deck. And on the deck, Pam would have a bird feeder and feed these cute little finches and these different little birds. And that was kind of a little thing of hers that she loved to do. And I enjoyed it too, except when the squirrels get in there. You know what I'm talking about, right? Those squirrels. Well, one day I was early in the morning and I was out there just praying and worshiping God. And I like to walk in the great room and just lift my hands and praise God and thank Him for His promises and His goodness and His faithfulness. And as I'm doing that, I'm getting distracted because this raven 
this big gangster came in and he sat on top of the bird feeder and he would just kind of pick at the bird food, throw it out, and he was like, he would kind of look around at all the little birds, kind of like, I dare you. I dare, I double dare you just to try to come in here. And all the little birds, they usually would be singing and tweeting. None of that. Silence. No praising and worshiping going on. And it's distracting me. And I'm kind of being distracted from my worship. And finally, I thought, you know what? Enough of this. I got to stop messing with that raven. And I said, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. Just went back to praising the Lord. Well, suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I see this like a bolt of lightning. This hawk, huge hawk, bolts down in attack mode straight down on our deck, smashes the raven on the deck, has him in one talon. The, the raven's wing is broken, laying back, and he's already dead. And then the, the hawk just jumps up on the banister with the raven in his claw and flies away. And all the little birds, there was rejoicing in the land, and they came back into the bird feeder. There was my suddenly, and I was thinking, wow, I, I got to go easy on this praising worship because it really is weaponized. <laughs> but let me go to the foundation of worship. Let me go to the foundation of worship before we get into the next stage of why we worship and why it is weaponized. Let's get right down to the root because you know the foundation of anything is usually the most important and determining factor of something. Like the foundation of your house, right? It, you may not see much of it, but it is decisive about the build of your home. It directs, it leads, it determines the outcome. I mean, your kitchen is the size it is, much to do with because of the foundation. It, it supports your kitchen, but it also limits. I mean, your, your kitchen can't be 100 feet wide because of the foundation of your home. So foundations kind of determine what the exterior, what the top is all about. So let's dig down on the foundation of what worship is. With regard to the foundation of worship, we've discovered in part one that it is spiritual protocol. Remember that word, spiritual protocol. It's spiritual protocol for coming into God's presence. After all, God is royalty. And I mean, we're not talking any royalty, royalty of all royalty, right? We know that Jesus is the king of kings. And it would only make sense that there is protocol for coming into the presence of God Almighty. So let's take a look at Psalm 100, verse 2. Listen to this. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. That's right. God wants you to come before his presence with singing. So the foundation of worship is, it is spiritual protocol for coming into the presence of God. It's not about how earthly beautiful your voice is. I know that's going to set some of you free. I, I, some of my friends already who complain about how bad they sing are already thinking, praise the Lord. It's not about how beautiful, earthly beautiful my voice is, but rather how heavenly beautiful your faith is. You see, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Psalm 100, verse 4 and 5. Let's continue on with this whole spiritual protocol. It goes, enter his gates with a song of thanksgiving. We're back to singing again. And his courts with praise. Well, that isn't necessarily musical, but it can be musical. It says, be thankful to him, bless and praise his name. Verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy and loving kindness are everlasting. His faithfulness endures to all generations. I want you to notice how that when you practice proper spiritual protocol, immediately the word of God points to his goodness, his mercy, his loving kindness, his enduring faithfulness, not just to you, but to your whole family. If you're a grandparent, to your children's children. The most dangerous thing a believer can do is think that the benefits of God's presence are just somehow a random or automatic outcome. They are on the other side of proper spiritual protocol. Always beware of ever interpreting God's word based on your terms. Remember Jesus told the woman at the well, God the Father is seeking True worshipers. See, th there's a lot of worship that goes on in the world. A lot of worship that goes on li in life. People can worship things. They can worship stuff. There's a lot of worship that goes on. But this is such an important topic. Jesus had to qualify it by saying true 
worshipers. He said the day is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That means we've got to know the true meaning of the term worship. God's definition, not my definition, not somebody down the street's definition, but we need to know God's definition. So let's dig down deep to understand the foundation of this word, of this term worship. And let's take the term back to God's glory. What does worship really mean? Why is it so important to God and to us? Remember, it's not just important to God. It's important to us. Is it singing? Is worship shouting? Is it going to church and lifting up your hands? Have you ever been in a church where people lift up their hands to worship God? Is that worship? Is it telling God what he wants to hear? You know, God's just so needy of affirmation. He needs us to tell him nice things. Is that it? Is worship what what many other religions do, bowing, sacrificing, fasting, self-abasing, and possibly even throwing yourself into a volcano to quench its fiery appetite? Is that really, really worship? You know, down through history, there have been many, many religions and false gods that have demanded human sacrifices, even unborn and newborn babies to be thrown in the fires. Today, most people would think such demonic worship is a thing of the past, but the truth is we've only become more clinical and sanitized. We're still just as sinful and in need of a Savior as 4,000 years ago. So again, tell me, what is true worship? I mean, the stuff that Jesus says Father God is seeking. There's this thing called the law of first mention Bible scholars use when they're trying to determine an overarching meaning or direction of a word found in Scripture. So let's use that principle. So the way it works is this. You take a word like worship and you find the very first time it's mentioned in the Bible. And by investigating the context and the use of that first mention, you can discover a prevailing principle or foundation that carries forward as the word is used again. We know that God never changes, right? So this, this principle will hold true. Therefore, his word is foundational, principle, unchanging. So let me say it this way. God doesn't redefine words and evolve with culture. Isn't that good news? I think that's just awesome news. He's constant, unchanging. God doesn't, you know, like if suddenly everybody's going to wear really wide ties, God doesn't change with the wide tie culture. <laughs> so the first mention of worship, when does the first mention of worship happen? Well, it just so happened in Genesis 22. It says that God tested or proved Abraham. Remember, Abraham and Sarah, they've been childless for their whole marriage. And finally, at the age of 100, Abraham gets his son Isaac from his beautiful 90-year-old wife, Sarah. Abraham adores his boy, Isaac. He loves this little boy to pieces. Now God tests Abraham and says, because God tests you to see what's in your heart. And God tests him and he, uh, he says, offer Isaac as a burnt offering up on one of these mountains. What? Is God really asking for a human sacrifice? Are you kidding me? No, no, no. Listen, just go with me and watch God's genius at work. We know this, that God is never pleased with the physical sacrifice. God's pleased with obedience. That's what God's always looking for. You know, it says in Romans 12, 1, that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God. God's only interested in what's living, what's beautiful, what's sanctified, what's holy, what's alive. God's the God of life, not of death. So go with me and let's watch God's genius at work here. Abraham gets some wood. Loads up the donkey with two servants helping him. He brings his only son Isaac along on this three-day journey. Finally, he sees the place that God's appointed for this sacrifice. And here's what he says. Let's take a look at Genesis 22.5. And Abraham said to his servants, settle down and stay here with the donkey. And I and the young man will go yonder and worship and come again to you. It's the very first mention of worship in the whole Bible. And did you see what Abraham said? He said, I and the young man will go and come again to you. Abraham's already got this faith in his heart that somehow, some way, he's going to sacrifice his son, but God's going to raise up his son from the dead and they're going to both come back 
to the servants and to the donkey. Okay, so I'm going to say more about this, but let me just finish the story. They go up to the mountain and Abraham and Isaac, they build the altar. altar. Isaac asks, where is the sacrifice, dad? Dad, where's the sacrifice? And here's what um, Abraham says. He said, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. Abraham then binds up Isaac, he ties him up, lays him on the altar, and pulls out his knife. Oh my goodness, this must have been such a moment. Abraham's heart had to be beaten, but I'm sure Isaac's heart was beating right as his dad's pulling up the dagger. As he raises the knife to slay his son, he hears the voice of the Lord. Listen to this. Don't you lay your hand on the lad. For now I know that you revere me since you had not held back from me your son, your only son. Look at what God says. He says, your son, your only son. And then Abraham unties Isaac and instantly he sees a ram caught in the thicket by its horns and offers the ram instead of his son. Then God says this to Abraham, blessing, I'm going to bless you. Abraham multiplying, I'm going to multiply you. Notice this is all happening on the other side of worship, the first mention of worship. God says, blessing, I'm going to bless you. Multiplying, I'm going to multiply you. Then God also says this, and in your seed, now the word there is capitalized, S, capital S-E-E-D, in your seed, not plural, but singular, because he's referring to Christ Jesus. In your seed, in that moment, you see Abraham just got pregnant some spiritual way with the very only begotten son of God Almighty, Jesus, for future generations. And God says this to Abraham, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Wow. What Abraham just did by faith, God was saying would bless the whole entire world. Abraham did not withhold his only son, so then God was able to give his only begotten son. Do you see that? Abraham had faith to give his only son, his faith that God took in Hebrews 11, you can read it. God took Abraham's obedience and willingness to offer up his only son. And when he did that, God saw that act of obedience obedience, that act of worship, that willingness to give all that I have, all of me to you, Father God, for all that you have for me. And in Abraham's heart, he's saying, for a split second, I'm going to say goodbye to my son. But I know God promised me that he would make a great nation of my son. So I believe God will resurrect him. God wouldn't ask for me to lay him down unless that God could raise him up. And in that moment, Abraham's faith was translated across the globe. And God said, I'm going to use your faith, Abraham, to give the world my only begotten son and he is going to actually be laid down as a sacrifice for sin and he will restore the world by the grace my grace to my love and my family isn't that beautiful praise God wow that's beautiful God wanted to bring the blessing to earth, but someone had to have faith for a resurrection from the death nobody had ever had faith for a resurrection from death. Everybody thought death was the end. It was the ultimate enemy. Nobody could overcome it. But think about Abraham. I've got this wonderful son, my beautiful son, but I'm 100 years old. I'm about to die soon. I'm not going to live forever. I'm about to die. And then my son will eventually die some way. And in his mind, as a loving father, he's thinking, how can I protect me and my family and my son and our legacy? The only way was to worship God. This thing that had never been done before to worship God and to give God all that I've got, even though it's a gift from God to give God all that I have, that I might have all that Father God has for me. And in that moment when he has faith for resurrection, God grabs Abraham's faith for resurrection. And Father God's like, I'll resurrect my son. I'll give my only begotten son to die for you. And with Abraham's faith, I'll resurrect my son. There's a man on earth that's standing in the gap and willing to believe that I can raise up a son from the grave. I'll use it on my son. Oh, man, can you see the outcome, the other side of true worship? Abraham's worship introduced the promise of the blessing. 
But Abraham's worship was strategically weaponized against the curse. It wasn't just the blessing that came in on Abraham. It was the weaponization of worship that came against the curse. Suddenly, death was on shaky ground. Suddenly, sin was on shaky ground because God just introduced real faith into the planet. And God had suddenly now been given permission to bring his son to earth and defeat the enemy once and for all. When Abraham offered his son, God could give his son. And let's not forget why Jesus came. Oh, you might be thinking John 10, 10, that Jesus came to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. And you would be exactly right. Jesus did come to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. But remember, as I've talked about something that's authentic, it's always got the head and always has the tail. For it to be uh, not counterfeit, but to be real, it's got to have both sides of the coin. And Jesus came to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. But Jesus also came for another purpose. Jesus came to destroy You might be thinking, what? Pastor Stephen, did I hear you right? Did you tell me Jesus came to destroy? That's right. Jesus came to bring down the hammer. Look, I got a hammer here. Jesus came to bring down. I got my hammer outfit on. (laughs) Jesus came to bring down the hammer on the enemy, your enemy, the enemy of your soul on death destruction and disease. Jesus was sent by God, yes, to bring us life and life more abundantly, but Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Look at 1 John 3, 8. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. For you, for me, he took our place to pay the price, but to reverse the curse, to destroy the grip of curse in your life. Think about this, using that hammer to nail Jesus to the cross. Why would God the Father hold back legions of mighty angelic warriors from stopping those Roman soldiers, those little minuscule, tiny little Roman soldiers from nailing nails in the hands of Jesus? Why would God the Father completely stand back and hold back his legions of mighty angels and stop them from interfering with those soldiers hammering nails into Jesus' hand. Why? Because using that hammer to nail Jesus to the cross weaponized our worship. You see, worship is meant to be weaponized. It's meant to work against the enemy. Yes, it's a conduit. It's a, it's a wire of blessing that allows God to bring the blessings of Abraham into our life. But it's also meant to be weaponized against the spiritual enemies of the cross. Take a look at Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of legal demands against us, which were hostile to us. And this certificate, Jesus has set aside and completely removed by nailing it to the cross. Jesus nailed your sin debt to the cross. And then verse 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us. See, it doesn't say anything about Roman soldiers. That wasn't the deal. When he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, those spiritual forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession and having triumphed them through the cross. Oh, my friend, isn't that wonderful? You see, worship doesn't actually give you the victory. No, it welcomes Jesus' victory that's already accomplished. He's already won. We're not trying to get him to win. Jesus has already won. Worship is an exchange of of all of us for all of him. Worship is welcoming God into your life, your situation, your sphere of influence. Abraham Abraham said this. He said, Father God, here's my son, my whole world, but we're vulnerable to death, to dying. God said, oh yeah, well, here's my son for the whole world, and he's destroyed death. Abraham did in one act of worship, one act of true worship in the Bible, and the outcome was blessing, multiplication, and the seed capital S, the seed of triumph. That's Jesus over evil. Death is forever vanquished, conquered. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says, death is swallowed up in victory. Whose victory? Jesus, the seed of Abraham. 
Remember the story in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 22? We'd already talked about in part one of King Jehoshaphat when they began to sing in praise. What's it say? The Lord set ambushments and their enemies were destroyed. See, it wasn't just about the singing, but the singing was protocol, spiritual protocol and obedience to God. God's like, I want to hear a song today. Look, the battle, I've got it. I'm going to take care of it. But you guys... I just want you just to invoke, enjoy my presence and begin to sing praise unto me. And it says, when they begin to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments and their enemies were utterly destroyed. Worship is weaponized to destroy the enemies of God. Remind me, why did Jesus come again? Yes, to give us life more abundantly, but to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus had no tolerance for pretend worship. He called it out. In Mark 7, verse 7, Jesus is talking and he says this, In vain, fruitlessly and without profit, do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments and the precepts of men. Oh, my friend, God gets no pleasure out of vain, useless worship. Worship that has no outcome, nothing following, no hammer of destruction to the enemy's works. If God inhabits the praises of his people, and we know from Psalm 22, verse 3, where it says, O oh, you who inhabits the praises of Israel, we know that God likes to sit down in the middle of our praises. And Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. Well, it's impossible for God's presence to come in and all of his goodness and blessing not be there with him. But at the same time, for God not to scatter and shatter and destroy and melt like wax his enemies. Read Psalm 68 if you get a chance. Read Psalm 68 and it says, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. God wants to bring the hammer down on your enemies because you being a child of his... The moment you ask Jesus in your heart, you being his child, the spiritual enemies of your life, they just became major targets of God because they are enemies of God. Anything that would want to hurt his child, it's not favorable to God. God loves you. God so loves you. And this is why he's given us the ability, the privilege to be true worshipers of God. Did you know anthrax can kill an elephant in just a few hours? It's an invisible enemy taking down this massive, huge mammal. Never forget this. The invisible in our life is critical. Your invisible, spiritual, supernatural enemies, they're the ones that are the problem. Not flesh and blood. Not people. Quit getting distracted by people. We're in a world and a culture right now where people are so distracted by what's happening horizontally. Your enemies are invisible. They're demonic. They're spiritual. They bring chaos. The Old Testament is full of visible enemies only to help give us a picture of the invisible enemies. Remember what Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 and 12 says. It says for you and me to put on the full armor of God so that we may be able to stand up against all the schemes and the strategies and the deceits of the devil. That's why we put on the full armor of God. And then verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. Can I say it this way? People, it's not against people. But it's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the spiritual places. That's the enemy that we get the armor of God on to defeat and overcome. When we worship, truly worship, we should be totally clothed in the armor of God. This Bible talk. This is, see, this is New Testament talk. You need to be armed and dangerous. Faith is your shield, but the sword of the Spirit is God's Word. It's good to have a shield, but you can't just live defensively. You've got to live on the offense. That's what worship is all about, going offensive and dealing a blow to the enemy because Christ has already won the victory. But we employ His victory here on earth every time we worship. Activate it, talk it, sing it. Use God's word and principle to worship him. And being a true worshiper, you activate the Lord's power over his enemies. 
you know, it was about three years or so ago. I got really, really bad news about somebody that I dearly, dearly love. It was such bad medical news about somebody who I love so much and who is like a hero to me. And with everything else going on in my life and all the demands and the craziness and the stress, the anxiety, I felt alone. I felt crushed. I felt weak. I, I even felt lost. You know, just like you, you've been there. I felt all those big whys come up. Like, why? Why, God? Why this? God. You know, you almost want to say, God, where are you? And, and you almost want to say, God, don't you care? But you know, 1 Peter 5 says that we're to cast all of our care upon him because he cares for us. God loves you so much for my friend. The circumstances talk. I understand that. The circumstances say it's impossible. I understand that. But you and I have to weaponize our life with worship and speak back the word of God, just like the psalmist David did, and say, God, you're faithful. Bless the Lord, O my soul, my mind, will, and emotions. Bless the Lord. Evil was trying to stake its claim in my life. Take my land. Overtake me with fear and anxiety. So what did I do? I knew the secret. I knew I had to worship God. Not because I felt like it. I want you to understand this. This has nothing to do with feelings. We walk by faith, not by senses, sensuality, not by sight, not by what we see, not by any of our feelings or senses. But I needed the victory of the cross that was already accomplished. So I needed to magnify not what I was feeling, but I needed to magnify what I knew the Word of God said here on earth. I needed to weaponize my worship. I began to bless the Lord. I began to magnify the Lord. I began to praise His name. I began to feel the weight of God's weaponizing praise. You know, you feel like the weight of those cares and worries and those doctor's reports. And you feel that weight over here and it's troubling you and it's arresting you and it's, it's interrupting your sleep. But I felt like the, the weight shifted to my worship and it became weaponized and suddenly there was a power in my life and I remember even just in the quiet in the, the the even with tears running down my face God began giving me songs that's where I started even writing that song God you are the way the way to freedom you are the life Yes, we're believing. And I started weaponizing my, my faith. I started weaponizing my worship and just singing, You are the way. And God began setting it free. God began delivering me. And suddenly a joy began replacing the sorrow and the sadness. Suddenly, Lord, was pushing back the grief as I was making away with this hammer and punching through depression and sorrow and the sickness and the grief. I was weaponizing. I was using the weapon of God's true worship against these enemies in my life. And from what, from what was evil to who was almighty, that's where my attention was going. I began thinking about the all-powerful one, the unfailing one, the unlimited one. Praise God for the victory of the cross. I just... Father, I praise you for the victory of the cross. See, I would worship him. Father, I thank you for your promises. I thank you that you will never leave us alone or forsake us. I thank you that you are with us. We can trust you. Your word is faithful. Sometimes at night I'd lay in bed in fear, trying to squeeze, feeling the fear, trying to squeeze the life out of me. And quietly I'd just sing. Pam had written that song, In the Presence of the Lord, There is Joy. And I'd just lay in bed just quietly. In the presence of the Lord, there is joy, and the joy of the Lord is my strength. Just quietly, even with tears running down my face, but suddenly even my tears became weighty. Suddenly even my tears got weaponized as I just put my attention on Him, and I began to magnify God over and over, and the weight of darkness would suddenly shift to the weight of the power of love and a sound mind. The, the weight would shift from fearing the evil report to suddenly knowing God's promises. The weight would shift from sadness and depression to the joy of the Lord. That's right. Gladness and joy 
can be weaponized against the enemy to defeat depression and sorrow and sadness. Right now, you can weaponize worship in your life with God's Holy Spirit, with His truth. Sickness can't stand against truth. Accusation cannot stand against God's Spirit. Depression, did you know it runs from worship? Sorrow and sadness have to flee from praise. Cancer, dementia, leukemia, arthritis, COVID-19, they all hate true worship. Poverty and division are powerless against the truth. Those evil spirits run from worship. They run from true worship. Worship the Lord. Worship His name. Lift your voice. Go on the attack and worship the name of the Lord. Worship the name of the Lord. Just where you are right now, just sing. I exalt thee. Sing. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh, Lord. Lift your eyes, lift your voice and sing. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Above all the situation, Lord, I exalt thee. Oh, Lord. Where Jesus is important, Jesus shows up.